part of my job description was I'll talk to anybody. And, and, and what I've learned over the years, uh, and, that's, and that's a span of about 20 years of my career, by the way, with, with some uh, interruptions to actually work for a small business. Uh -huh. uh, what, I, what I learned is there are, there are kind of some timeless elements that, that a small business has got to master in order to be successful in selling to government at any level. So, so I, like, I think that's a great segment. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, we're listening. So the first thing that I, I would say is understand what your value proposition is. You know, I, I talk to people. People would come and talk to me, and, and they would have these great ideas, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll put that in quotes, and I don't mean to be disparaging about it because I think they were very enthusiastic about you know, their idea, and the idea had a value proposition, and I would listen. And, and with an understanding of the government and how it worked, I'd say, you know, that's not really the market you want to focus on. Because what I hear you saying is this is not a tool for community X, but this is really a tool for community Y in the government. And let me tell you why it's a tool for community Y, because community Y does function A, you know, and community X does function B. And while they're related, you know, community, you know, B is not going to not going to use your tool. You know, it's best at community A. So, so I would say that the number one thing is, is, is so know essentially, you know, the market that you really are going to target and know where your value proposition targets. The, okay. the, the second thing I would say is understand who you're selling to. Uh, and, and I'm going to use uh, the district government as a, an example, and I also use the Department of the Navy as an example. So, so the district government procurement system, while I was what was called the chief procurement office, officer, uh, was, was a hybrid because it was all of these satellite, what we called agency chief contracting officers, who had some level of autonomy, uh, depending on dollar value and complexity of the deal, uh, and, and their obligation to me as the chief procurement officer was to follow the rules and the regulations. But from a transactional perspective, uh, I did not do some of that work. Uh, now, from a transactional perspective, I had a staff at what we call central office who did do some of that work, the more complex work, the, the, the highly complex, you know, very politically visible type stuff, the high dollar value stuff. So you really had kind of this, you know, federated model in the district government. And if you don't understand that you've got a federated model in the district government and who really is from an agency, an organizational perspective, uh, the folks that want to buy what you have to sell, then you're going to waste a lot of shoe leather. Uh, I, you know, in the Navy, it's very much the same way. So people would come and talk to me about, you know, doing business with the Navy. And the first thing I would say to them is, well, you understand that I don't buy anything in the Pentagon here. <laughs> uh, that, that I have, you know, 10 or 11, what we call uh, echelon two, organizations that have all the contracting authority. And if you think about headquarters as being echelon one and, and you know, to draw a private se or public sector uh, or private sector analogy, I'm sorry, you know, as the operating divisions in a multi, you know, uh, business corporation is being like, you know, the operating groups, we had about 11 operating groups that, right. that had different missions, right? So I had my aviation product line and my maritime product line and my space, you know, and, and, and electronic uh, warfare product line. I had uh, the Marine Corps product line, you know, for troops and so on. So, so if you don't understand how we're organized, you can spin your wheels talking to a lot of the wrong people. Yes, I agree. Um, the third thing I would mention is, is this. So go in with the idea that you're going to listen rather than talk first. Because a lot of folks have problems. And if, you, and if you've done all the other things, right, you know, if you understand, you think you understand your value proposition, you think you understand the organization, um, there, there's still, you know, this issue of, hey, I talk to a lot of people every day who tell me they can solve my problem. And as I start talking to them, they don't necessarily demonstrate that they understand what my problem is. 
So, so I would argue if you really want to make a sale, if you want to really want to establish a relationship, the first thing you need to do is you need to really walk in with what, I, what I'll call a listening heart. You know, hear the person who needs something and listen to their pain points and the problem that they're trying to solve. And, and then the fourth thing, and, and this is the last kind of timely, enduring thing I would say, network, network, network. Uh, you know, often the, the entry into a buying organization is a contracting officer. Okay. Uh, generally, contracting officers have no requirements. They simply manage the flow of requirements through the system. So you're going to have to go to trade shows and you're going to have to go to industry days. Uh, you're you're going to have to talk to people who have real needs uh, to, to get yourself and your product or service known. Uh, and, and to have them, uh, you know, be cognizant when, when that need comes up. You know, you'll, you'll deal with a contracting officer eventually if you're going to pursue business. But, but if the technical folks, as we like to refer to them, don't know who you are or what your value proposition is, you know, you, it, hard to get on the radar screen. So, so industry days, professional organizations, trade shows, conferences, Anytime the government, you know, you know, has has uh, has folks available to talk to you, take advantage of that. The the other thing is, you know, and and depending on the organization, we did a lot of business with very very large companies, right? I right. mean, there are no small businesses yeah. that supply nuclear submarines or aircraft carriers, right, right? Right. But they have a supply chain wide and deep, and they have people whose mission it is to do outreach to small business people and, uh, and, and to you know, minority-owned business people, network with them as well. Uh, you know, and, and in whatever government organization, if you're trying to sell directly, we have people who are called small business program managers whose job it is to look for opportunities for small businesses to get in there. And, and uh, you know, we have... Uh, website, federal business opportunities, Fed biz ops, you know, folks should be looking at that. So, so a lot of this is, Hey, what's my value proposition? Who needs it? How do I go find the folks that need it in the organization I want to sell into? And how do I build a network that gives me visibility to be able to take suspect to prospect? Hmm. I like it. I like it. Now, you said um, these are some timely principles. What would you say? Um, and I and I look back and it and I see you've been working in this federal contract since like around the eighties. What would you say has changed from then to now? Well, I, I think uh, there there's been a lot more emphasis uh, across different classes, and and that's a double edged sword okay. because on one hand it introduces more opportunity, but on the other hand, it also introduces a level of complexity for procurement people and also people trying to sell to them. So I, I started uh, in this business with the Navy, as a matter of fact, in 1978, the summer of 1978. And uh, when I started, we basically had, you know, three, if you will, special emphasis programs, right? So, okay. so we had small businesses uh, set aside under the Defense Production Act. We had small disadvantaged business, and I'll include, uh, it, you know, and that's our, you know, the 8A program uh, okay. with the Small Business Administration. And then we had these things called labor surplus areas set aside. And, and if you, well, I'm, I'm dating myself, but, you know, we're coming out of the, the mid-70s. This is policy that came out of the mid-70s, you know, when we were hitting stagflation, right? And, uh -huh. and um, you know, we had these pockets of real, you know, unemployment, and we had workforce there. So, so the federal government said, hey, when, when we have people in one of these pockets that can do work for us, we're going to set that work aside for them. So, so when I came in 41, almost 41 years ago, those were the three areas. So, so today, we have small business set-asides. We have small disadvantaged business program. 
Uh, we have women-owned business uh, set-asides. We have service-disabled veterans set-asides. We have uh, a preference program for what's called Ability One, uh, which are our uh, national industries for the blind, national industries for severely handicapped, and, 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 and in those, you know, kind of umbrella organizations, because it's very decentralized, you find a lot of our wounded warriors. Mm. Uh, we have... Um, uh, we have what we call hub zones, right? right? Which is the historically underutilized business zone. So it says basically, if if you've got a company in a, uh, a geographic area, generally done by census tract, uh, which is you know got persistent higher unemployment, and thirty five percent of the people in this company live you know work in this zone, you know we should set that aside. So so as you can see. Uh, we've moved from about, you know, three pretty well-defined uh, programs that didn't really overlap very much okay. to this plethora of, you know, preference and set-aside programs, uh, which overlap, can overlap quite a bit. So, so there is uh, a, a level of confusion for both acquisition personnel as well as the people who sell to them. Mm. That, that would be the big change. That was one of them. So, so another one of the, the big changes, uh, you know, that I see is, is the, uh, the application of technology here. Uh, when, when I started in this business in 1978, you know, uh, literally in, in the government, desk calculators were cutting edge, right? Like CI-85. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, it's, it's, you know, you were like, uh, you know, sitting at your desk with a phone and a, and a calculator and you were uh -huh. making calls to find sources. Okay, okay. So, did you, let me ask you this, where, uh, um, did you ever work with a slide ruler? Uh, I, I, I owned a slide ruler and uh, a slide rule in high school. Uh -huh. And my, to my great regret, I don't have it anymore because it would be worth a fortune on eBay. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, please continue. I'm an engineer, so I, you know, I know oh, okay. about those, those things. Right. So, so, you know, think about now what, what you have is, is, is you have this uh, explosion, this information technology explosion, which, which has done a couple of things. One, it has really kind of, if you will, I democratized work. As, as I like to say, right? You know, it, it's eliminated some of the clerical specialties we had, you know, stenographers, typists, the typing pool, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. but, but the other thing it's allowed us to do is to aggregate uh, information. So, so small businesses are selling into different platforms than they used to because yes. uh, the platform used to be the telephone. The, the, the other thing uh, that, that's happened is as, as we get a better understanding of uh, what I'll call demand management, right, which is, you know, how we essentially stimulate demand in an organization uh, and, and how does industry organize to supply that demand, uh, there's a real challenge for small business, and I'll, and I'll give you an example. Uh, so 20 years ago, uh, we bought in the Navy most of our um, non-tactical information technology, I, I won't say in a decentralized manner. I think that's, you know, the safest way to say it. So, so there was a real opportunity at the prime contractor level for small businesses to sell, you know, into that market, right? You had resellers, you know, who could literally, you know, be outside uh, the gates of, you know, Cherry Point Marine, you know, air station there or Great Lakes Naval, you know, training center. And, you know, when you needed toner cartridges or you needed an extra PC or you needed a copy of DBase 3 Plus, they were your go-tos. Okay. Well, today, because we understand essentially how that demand is aggregated and we need to reduce redundancy and we also need to be able to do the information assurance, information security work, We've outsourced the entire administrative network of the Department of the Navy to a company called Perspecta, which used to consist of, and I, and I don't want to go through the entire genealogy of uh, Perspecta, but it, but it started with uh, Ross Perot's EDS and, and went to Hewlett.
the Packard and it's, and it's now kind of spun and reorganized and it's this, you know, very purpose built company that sells into this marketplace. So, so those guys that were sitting outside the gate, you know, selling toner or selling the one off PC or the one off software package no longer have that business. So, so, you know, they again have to go approach the big primes in some of right. these fields, you right. know, to, to be able to, to sell into these markets because the, 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 the introduction of technology has essentially changed the nature of some of the markets that they used to sell into in the government. So, so I think perspective, those I've never heard of perspective actually before. Our perspective, they do, they've managed to, you said the administrative side. Right. So, so the, the Navy, uh, has an, as a network, we call it the Navy Marine Corps internet. It okay. is probably the largest, uh, network uh, in existence, it is 400,000 seats and 800,000 users, and it serves the entire department of the Navy. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the kind of the genealogy. So we started out with, with EDS, Ross Perot's old company, uh, after, you know, he and GM got divorced and, uh, they eventually sold it to Hewlett Packard. And Hewlett Packard then spun off the hardware and the services folks in, into different uh, into different entities, and then pieces of Computer Science Corporation spun out uh, and merged with the government services part of Hewlett Packard to create a company called DXC, and then DXC uh, and I and I forget off the top of my um, my head what the company was, but but there was essentially another company that was owned by a a, a private uh, owned by a hedge fund, basically a private venture right. uh, that did a lot of this IT type work, and and they wanted to get out of that business and into the maintenance, repair, and operation business. So so they spun that out, and DXC merged with them to create Perspecta. Hmm. Okay, and they are so they created this network for you guys, and how, so how long? How I mean, what does the actual well, network do? Was how was it used? Well, it is you know so so I wouldn't say they they created it. Uh, essentially, what they did was they they aggregated the technology assets that the Department of the Navy had. Okay, and and they rationalized it and rearchitected it to be a coherent and cohesive network. And, and it's essentially our administrative network. And what I mean by that is, is you know, when I came in to work, you know, the, the analogy I used to use uh, when I worked in the Pentagon was it was like, it was like going uh, to, uh, you know, to watch TV on, on your cable, right? So mm -hmm. everything on, you know, my side of the wall plug was actually owned by Perspecta. The PC, uh, all the software, uh, the keyboard, the monitor, the, the whole shoot and match, and much like your cable box, you turned it on every morning, mm -hmm. and and you were able to essentially do uh, your email. Uh, you were able to do some spreadsheets, some PowerPoint, write some documents, uh, and use all of our Navy specific kind of back end office software. Okay, and you know, the expectation was that you would be able to do this in, in, in an extremely secure environment that okay. was shielded from our adversaries. So, so this was the network they were running for the Department of the Navy, which consists of the Navy and the Marine Corps. Mm. Okay. Right. Okay. But if you were selling toner cartridges years ago or printers or copiers for that matter, if you were the reseller of those things and you were a small business and you kind of, you're not you're you're now selling those things to Perspecta. You're not selling them directly to the United States Navy. And if you don't understand that, you're not probably selling them at all. Yeah, you're not selling them at all. I would agree. Yeah, you're not selling them at all. Interesting. Now, um, you mentioned a couple of things. You, uh, the first thing you mentioned was there's a, a plethora of options uh, between before to now with regards to the special emphasis programs. Um, but we haven't, you say, I know we know it provides confusion, but um, is there more participation now because of this or is it less participation or is it about the same? Well, I, I can't, I can't, uh, uh, 
I'm, well, let me caveat this because I'm quoting numbers that I've seen now from memory, right? Okay, okay. But, but as, I, as I believe, uh, the, the numbers demonstrated that we were, we were sending more dollars to small businesses. Right. But we were sending them to fewer small businesses. There you, yes, those are the numbers I know. Yes. Yeah, those are the same numbers I've read. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've said those are some of the same numbers I've read where, yeah, we've hit, I think, um, they've hit the hard, largest amount that they've ever sent, which, again, makes sense because we're spending more as well, right? So, obviously, we're spending a lot more in 2018 than we were spending in 1980. Um, and so, just on sheer volume, it would make sense that they get more. But, yeah, it seems like the participation um, has been significantly reduced. And I think that's where um, the challenges are that the people my audience is running into is um, how do you know how do they participate? And yeah. you know, part yeah, of the right part of the idea is you know they've they created these programs and these avenues, um, but what it seems like people are falling short on is teaching them how to use it, how to navigate it, um, and the, the the education piece. So it seems like they're, I mean, and we know that we've got support agencies like the PTAX and the, the veteran, uh, the VBOC centers and um, right. small business development centers, uh, the SBA. We, you know, we know we have, but it still seems, um, it seems like we're still not closing the gap. And I'm not here so we can really talk about a solution, just more just trying to understand um, the issues that are present and maybe help provide some insight into ways in which we, they can uh, close that gap. At least, you know, some of the people who are listening to this. Um, going back to um, when you said people were meeting with you and talking with you and ha having to understand your value proposition. I mean, as the director, how did someone get to, how did they get to you? Was it at a networking event of some sort? I, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I had a really simple philosophy, right? <laughs> you know, I would imagine you're probably pretty difficult to get to. No, I was actually pretty easy to get to. Really? Um, yeah, it, you, 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 you'd, you'd have to call some of my former EAs. I, I think I used to drive them crazy, but, but I was very serious. Uh, you know, one of my official functions was at the Competition Advocate General uh, and, and, and I really believed very strongly that that meant my job was to talk to anyone. So I, a couple of things, I mean, just about kind of how I did business in, in that role. Uh, I was a pretty visible speaker. Uh, you know, I was out, uh, when, when people asked me to come and talk to them, if, you know, if I could justify that from a, from a financial and a mission perspective, I would go out and talk to, to industry groups, to other government groups, to professional associations, uh, and, uh, and, and, and fairly widely. Uh, I, I worked fairly closely with, with Emily Harmon, who was, until she retired, uh, our Office of Small Business Programs uh, Director, and now a, a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Smith. And, and we would do things uh, much like we're doing. You know, we would do, I, th I think, in the last, you know, six months of her tenure there, I think I did three Facebook Lives with her. Okay. Uh, and, and we talked about, you know, one of them specifically focused on small business and, and another one uh, focused on uh, just kind of the regulatory environment and what was going on. Uh, so, so I would do that. And, uh, you know, I used to tell people all the time, if, if you want to get on my calendar, you know, I was on LinkedIn. I think I probably got about 2,800, uh, you know, uh, um, in my network on LinkedIn, right. I would say, if you, if you want to talk to me, you know, call my EA, here's the number, here's the email, and he'll find some time on my calendar for you. Okay. And then okay. people, you know, would also, people I knew in the business, uh, you know, former federal employees who are now, you know, consulting with small businesses and so forth, would, would bring folks to talk to me. So, so I, I, I don't perceive myself as, as being hard to get to. Okay. Uh, you know, so I, I, I would say that um, I, I wasn't standing on the street corner with a billboard that said small <laughs> questions answered here. Right. But on the other hand, if, if you said to me, hey, I'd like to come and talk to you about something, uh, I never turned anybody away. Okay. 